What's up my stat stars? Are you struggling with probability? Do you feel the probability problems right now are impossible? Well, let me make your life a lot easier because in this video, we're gonna be talking about the top five scenarios that come out of basic probability when it comes to questions on the AP exam. Now, unit four of a probability is really difficult and really large. It covers basic probability, random variables, and probability models. So in this video, I want again, I wanna give you the top five scenarios that typically come out of basic probability that could easily show up on the AP exam or even show up on your unit tests in class. Now, if you're looking for way more help, more questions, more practice, please check out my ultimate review packet that you can find at ultimatereviewpacket.com. There's a link in the description below. I think it'll really give you that extra edge to get you over top of maybe a B that you want to get turned into an A or a C that you want to get turned into a B. Or if you just want to better understand all of the nuances of AP statistics, the ultimate review packet will really help you. All right, let's dive into scenario number one. Now, in this scenario, you're typically given some generic probabilities. Like in this case, we're told that the, the probability of event A is 0.23 or 23%, and the probability of event B is 0.41 or 41%, and we're asked to find the probability of A or B. So first, make sure you understand that, that symbol, that U, or that symbol U stands for union, is or it's asking you to find the probability of A or B. Now, in this first example, we are told that event A and event B are mutually exclusive. So how do we find the probability of A or B? First, we're going to start off with the addition formula. This is the king of formulas when it comes to probability. It is the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Now, First, write down that formula. Fill in what we know. We know the probability of A is 0.23. We know the probability of B is 0.41. Now, here is the extra information that's going to help us solve this problem. When we know two events, in this case A and B, are mutually exclusive, that means they cannot happen at the same time, which automatically tells me that the probability of A and B is a big, beautiful zero. So now I'm going to continue to go back to my formula, substitute in the probability of A and B being zero, and now I have a really simple formula to solve to find the probability of A or B. It's going to be 0.23, the probability of A, plus 0.41, the probability of B, minus zero, because A and B are mutually exclusive, I automatically know that the A and B is zero. So at the end of that math, pretty simple, I get a probability of A or B being 0.64, or 64%. Now, in this next example, we actually have the exact same scenario. The probability of A is given to be 0.23. The probability of B is given to be 0.41. And we're also asked to find the probability of A or B. But this time, we are told that events A and B are independent. So once again, I'm going to first start off with that amazing addition formula because anytime I'm given probability of this, probability of that, probability of A or B, I'm going to go right to that formula because that formula really is the king when it comes to probability. It's got everything we need in it. So we start off with the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Now, when two events are independent, what does that tell you? It means that one event does not affect the next or vice versa. So A outcome doesn't affect B, B outcome doesn't affect a, and that tells us something really important. That means that the probability of A and B is automatically the probability of A times the probability of B. But that statement is only true if we know that they are independent, which is exactly what was said in this problem. So we already know the probability of A, 0.23. We know the probability of B, 0.41. Now we can easily find the probability of A and B. All we got to do is multiply 0.23 times 0.41, and we get 0.0943 for the probability of A and B. Put everything together in our addition formula. We got the probability of A, 0.23, plus the probability of B, 0.41, minus the probability of both A and B, which we just found out was 0.0943. And quick addition, subtraction, we get a probability of 0.5457. Easy, easy, easy. So in this example, we're using the addition formula. It's definitely going to come up probably somewhere in the multiple choice section of the AP exam. And we're given some information. The first problem that we were told they're mutually exclusive, which automatically means the A and B is zero. And in this problem, we were told that they're independent, which means that A times B is the probability of A and B. And if we didn't have either of those pieces of information, well, we actually couldn't solve the problem because we would need to know what the probability of A and B is to find the probability of A or B. All right, here we find ourselves in a very, very, very familiar situation that always comes up on the AP exam, typically multiple choice, sometimes on an FRQ. 
Here is this similar sounding problem. 3% of men have a particular disease. There is a test for this disease that could say positive, meaning you have it, negative, meaning you don't, but the test is not perfect. So here's what we know. If a man has the disease, the test will reveal a positive result 95% of the time. I mean, the man has a disease, it should say it's positive, but it only happens 95% of the time, which means 5% of the time the test says it's negative, even though the man has the disease. But if the man does not have the disease, there is still a chance of a positive test 15% of the time, even though the man doesn't have the disease. So if you don't have the disease, it should say negative, which would happen 85% of the time, begin because 15% of the time it gives a positive. Now, typically when you're given one of these types of scenarios, there are two really common questions. The first one is, what is the probability that a man gets a positive result on this test? The second question is a conditional one. It says, given a man gets a positive test or a positive result on the test, what is the probability he actually has the disease? So we're going to walk through each of these types of questions, but first, in any type of question that's deals with conditional probabilities, like if this, then that. If he has the disease, here's the chance of a positive. If he doesn't have the disease, here's the chance of a positive. Anytime you see those if or given statements, a tree diagram is going to be your best friend. So let's walk through a tree diagram for this particular problem. So we're going to start off with a man. And that man either has a disease or he doesn't. 3% chance he has a disease, 0.03. Automatically, 97% chance he does not have the disease. Now, based on the information given, if he has the disease, so we're going to follow that top branch, there's a 95% chance of a positive result, like it should. That'd be a true positive. But that means there's a 5% chance of a negative result. That would be called a false negative. It says negative, says he doesn't have the disease, but he really does. Then we could follow the next branch, and that is the branch that he does not have the disease. And we were told through the problem that even though he doesn't have the disease, the test will still say positive 15% of the time. That's a false positive. It says you have the disease when you really don't. Then the other 85% of the time would be a negative result, which would be a true negative. It says negative, and you don't have the disease. Now, to get to the end of any one of these branches, you have to multiply because we have multiple things going on. The man either has a disease or he doesn't, and then he's going to get a positive or negative. Multiple events multiply. And because these are conditional, we are allowed to multiply. So let's talk about that top branch. That top branch is very specific. It's not just 95%, because to get to that 95%, we have to first have the disease. So to get to that end of that branch, we have to have the disease, 0.03, and then test positive, 0.95, and that 0.95 is on the condition that he does have the disease. So the end of that branch would be 0.03 times 0.95 or 0.0285. So 2.85% of men would both have the disease and test positive. And then you could find those same probabilities for any one of those branches. For example, the bottom branches does not have the disease, 97%, 0.97, and then test negative, 0.85. So again, that would be you do not have the disease and then you test negative. That's a true negative. 0.97 times 0.85 or 0.8245. And the other two branches are just the same. Again, follow the branch. It's not just the end. You got to get there first. All right, now that we understand the tree diagram, let's get back to answering our first question. What is the probability that a man tests positive? Well, if you go back to that tree diagram, there are two different ways a man could test positive. He could have the disease and then test positive or he could not have the disease and then test positive. The number one mistake kids make on a problem like this is they just add the 95 and the 15, the both positive numbers that are sending the problem. But with that, you're going to get something over 100% that doesn't even make sense. So again, you've got to follow the branches. You have the disease, 0.03, and then you test positive, 0.95, or you do not have the disease, 0.97, and then you test positive, 0.15. Now I'm putting a plus sign in the middle because you're hearing that word or. It's either this branch or this branch. Both things can have happen at the same time. You can't have the disease and test positive and at the same time not have the disease and test positive. That's impossible. So that's why we're putting that plus sign in the middle. So do the math and you get a nice salt answer of 0.174. 17.4% of men who take this test will test positive. Now, the next question is conditional. It says, given that a man tests positive, 
What is the probability he actually has the disease? First, first you got to make sure you really understand conditional probability. We have that line. And to the right of the line, or after the line, goes the condition. So really read the question carefully. What is known? Well, it says given he tested positive. So it's known that he tested positive, and then in front of the line, or to the left, is what I'm trying to find the probability of that he actually has the disease. If the question simply said, what's the probability a man has a disease? Well, that's easy. 3%, we were told that in the problem. But here they're giving us a condition that he tested positive. So first and foremost, you got to make sure you write it out correctly. Then you got to know the formula for conditional probability, which is on the AP exam formula sheet. It's a really simple formula. In the numerator is the probability of both A and B, and the denominator is the probability of just the condition B. So in our case, the numerator is going to be the probability of both testing positive and having the disease, or having the disease and testing positive. So that's going to be 0.03 times 0.97. Easy. And then in the denominator is going to be the probability that the man gets a positive result. That's the condition, given that he had a positive result. Well, we already calculated that to be 0.174, but again, you can walk through that real quick. You just have to know there's two different branches that lead to a positive result, and since the denominator just cares about getting a positive result, both of them have to be in the bottom, 0.97, or excuse me, let's start with the having the disease, 0.03 times 0.95, and then, or, 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 excuse me, the other option is not have the disease, 0.97, and then testing positive, 0.15. So the top is just going to be the 0.03 times 0.95, having the disease and testing positive. That's 0.0285, divided by the denominator, having a positive result, 0.174, and we get a final answer of 0.1638. So if a man gets a positive result, there's only about a 16% chance that he actually has the disease. Why does that seem kind of low? You would think, well, if I got a positive result, I should have the disease, right? Well, think about it. First, so few men have the disease in the first place. So the 85% that is, or excuse me, the 15% that's positive when you do not have the disease is actually going to be way more common than the 95% of people who get a positive when they don't have the disease because most people don't have the disease. All right, so hopefully this question makes sense. Definitely a little bit of a tricky one and very, very common. I almost see it every single year on the AP exam, so watch out for it. Really make that tree diagram. It definitely helps seeing the different avenues or the different branches for the problem. Another very common scenario when it comes to basic probability is working with a two-way table. These make for really easy questions as long as you know what you're doing. So here is a two-way table based on data collected from 1,092 people. So 1,092 people were asked, do you take cover of a car in, into consideration when you're purchasing a new car? Some people said yes, some people said no, some people said maybe. Then we were asked, okay, what is one additional feature that matters when you purchase a car? Like comfort, cost, performance, reliability, safety, those are the different things that we got. So we make this awesome two-way table. And with a two-way table, we can ask you a ton of probability questions. So the first question we see here says, if we select a person at random from these 1,092 people, what is the probability that the person picked said yes, color matters to them, or they said that safety is an additional feature that matters to them. So first I see that word or. I'm jumping right to the king of probability formulas, and that is the addition formula, because the addition formula literally helps us find the probability of event A or event B. So we're going to write down that formula right away. So we have the probability of yes or safety. So the formula is pretty simple to follow. We're going to take the probability of those that said yes. We're going to find the probability that somebody said safety. And then we're going to subtract the probability of somebody said yes and safety. Now keep in mind, we're not subtracting to get rid of those people. We're just subtracting to prevent them from being double counted or counted twice. So what is the probability that somebody said yes? Well, 490 people out of 1,092 said yes, so there's my probability. Plus, what's the probability that somebody said safety? Well, that would be 376 out of 1,092. But if you think about it, the 152 people that were counted amongst those that said yes, color matters, but those 152 people were also counted amongst the 376 that said safety matters. We don't want them to be double counted. We want them to count, but not twice. So that's why we're going to subtract away the 152 people who both said yes and safety. So that's going to give us our final answer of 714 out of 1,092, or 0.654. Pretty easy question if you know what you're doing and use the addition formula. 
The next very type of question or very common type of question that comes with one of these two-way tables is a conditional question. So here it is. A person is picked at random from this group of people. What is the probability that they said, yes, color matters, given that they selected reliability as an additional feature. So first you have to recognize that this is a conditional question because we have a probability question. What is the probability that somebody said, yes, color matters when it comes to buying a car. But afterwards there's a given, given that we already know that they selected reliability as that additional feature. So first you gotta be able to write down what's being asked of you. So we're gonna use that line. That line in the middle of our probability statement is gonna reflect conditional. To the right of the line or after the line comes what we know already or the condition. In this case, they selected reliability. In front of the line or to the left of the line is what we're trying to find the probability of, and that is that they said yes, color matters. So we're trying to find the probability of yes, given that they said reliability. Now, the conditional formula is really easy to use, and the numerator is gonna go both the proportion of people or the probability that somebody selected that said yes and reliability. So go back and look at your table. That was 128 people out of 1,092. So the probability that somebody said yes and reliability, 128 out of 1,092. In the denominator is the probability of the condition alone, which is reliability. So what's the probability that somebody gets picked and they said reliability? Well, there are 248 people that said reliability out of 1,092. Now, if you know even the littlest bit of algebra, you recognize that those 1092s in the denominators are going to cancel out or reduce to a one, and all we're left with is 128 out of 248. Now, some people don't even need the conditional probability formula to understand this answer. They understand that the condition is that you had to have already selected reliability as your additional feature. That limits my denominator to 248 people. I'm only allowed to look at the 248 people who said reliability. And out of those 240 people, 128 of them said yes. So there's my final answer of 128 out of 248 or a probability of 0.516. But those types of conditional questions coming out of a two-way table are extremely common and really important for you to know how to do on the AP exam. This fourth different scenario is actually one of my favorites. It deals with a probability distribution. So in this case, a game is played where a player can score zero, one, two, or three points on any one play of the game. And the probabilities of getting zero, one, two, or three points are in the table here. Now we're also told that the plays of the game are independent of each other. So if you play one game and then you play second, the outcome of that second game doesn't matter at all whatever the outcome of the first was. That's what independent means. Now that's really, really important. That means we don't have to worry about, okay, does what happened first change with what happened second? Are these probabilities gonna go up? Are these probabilities gonna go down? No, the probabilities are gonna stay exactly the same because when you're independent, that's what probabilities do, they don't change. Now, if we were to ask you questions about playing the game once, we'll be pretty boring. Right? What's the probability you score one point? 30%. What's the probability you score three points? 40%. I mean, very simple. But the key, or the, the real scenario I'm trying to get at here, is what happens if you play the game more than once? So a very common question with a um, game question like this is if you play the game twice, and you add up your two scores from the first game and the second game, what is the probability that you get a sum of, let's say, four? All right, so I'm trying to find the probability that I get four total points. The first thing I have to do is consider how many different ways can that happen or what are the different scenarios where that can happen. I can get a one in the first game and a three in the second game. That's gonna add up to my total of four points or I could get a three in the first game, a one in the second game, and that's gonna add up to four points. Now you have to understand that those are two distinctly different outcomes because there is a first game and there is a second game. So I can get the one first, the three second, or the three first and the one second. Very different outcomes even though it both involves a one and a three. And then the third scenario that results in me getting four points is two on the first game, two on the second game. Now I don't have to reverse that because if you reverse it, it's the exact same thing. A two on the first game, a two on the second game. Reverse it all you want and it's still a two on the first game and a two on the second game. So now that I understand the three different scenarios, I can start talking about the probabilities of them. What's it going to take for me to get a one and then a three? Well, the probability I get a one is 0.3. And then, so I'm going to multiply the probability I get a 3 is 0.4. So I got 0.3 times 0.4 or 0.12. Then I got to get a 3 or a 1. Oh, excuse me, I said that wrong. A 3 and then a 1. 
That would be 0.4 for the 3, and then 0.3 for the 1. Now, multiplication order does not matter, so I get 0.12 in either scenario. But there are distinctly different outcomes, 1 then 3, or 3 then 1. So even though I get the same probability, I still take both of them into account. And the final probability is getting a 2 and then a 2. That's going to be 0.20. And then another 0 0.20, so 2 and then a 2. 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.04. Now, only one of these outcomes could actually happen on any given plays of the game. They can't all happen at the same time. So that's why I'm going to add them together. So it's either going to be the 1, then the 3, or the 3 and then the 1, or the 2 and then the 2. That's 0.12 plus 0.12 plus 0.04, or for a grand total of 0.28, or 28% chance that you get a total of 4 points when you play this game twice. Now, it's super important that I remind you that I could not solve this problem if I wasn't told that they were independent of each other. That allows what happens on the second game, all the probabilities are going to stay the same. They don't change just because something happened on the first game. That's really, really important. All right, in this last scenario, we are given a bag of marbles, and we are told that the distribution of color of marbles in the bag is as follows. So 20% are red, 30% are blue, 30% are yellow, 10% are green, and 10% are orange. All right, we're going to select two marbles out of the bag with replacement, which means we're going to take one out, look at it, note its color, maybe write it down, and then put it back in and select another one. Okay, what is the probability that you get the same color? You pick out two marbles with replacement, you get the same color. Okay, so we have to first off understand the scenarios. I could get red and then red, that would result in two of the same color, blue and then blue, yellow and then yellow, green and then green, or orange and then orange. So now I just have to walk through each of those scenarios. Red and then red would be 0.2 times 0.2. Now, it's so important that I put that marble back. That's what allows it to stay 20%. So if 20% are marbles in that bag are red, when I reach in the second time, because I put the first marble back, it's still 20%. So 20% times 20%, 0.2 times 0.2, 0.04. Then for the blue, then blue, we got 0.3 times 0.3. For the yellow, then yellow, we got 0.3 times 0.3. For the green, and then green, we got 0.1 times 0.1. And then for the orange and the orange, we got 0.1 times 0.1. Now, we don't have to worry about switching these because orange and then orange is orange and then orange. I can't switch it around and make it be any different. Now, again, only one of these scenarios can actually happen on any given trial of this situation, so I don't multiply them all together, I add them all together. So after I've multiplied to figure out each of those individual outcomes, I then add all them together to get my grand total of 0.24 or 24% chance that I get the same color. Regardless of what color that is, I get the same color. Now let's go back to that same problem with the distribution of marbles. Now what if it said that we are not going to replace slice, or we're going to select two marbles without replacement, which means we take a marble out, keep it, take another marble out. Now what would the probability be that we get the same color? Well, hmm, that'd be a little bit tougher. We actually couldn't figure it out with what's given here. Because we know that for that first marble, for example, we can get red and then red, right? That would result in the same color. The first marble being red would be 0 0.20 or 20%, but we don't know about that second marble because, you know, if we get a red one, well, there's one less red marble in the bag, and there's actually one less total marble in the bag, so we don't really know because we can't figure out the probability of that second marble being red because what we did on the first selection changed that probability since we didn't put the marble back. Now, unless we were told how many marbles total were in the bag, how many red, how many blue, how many yellow, how many green, how many orange, then we could actually figure it out. We would just have to walk through it. But with this little information, we actually can't. But it really brings up an important valid point that we need to talk about. And that point is the 10% condition. So here's the deal. When sampling without replacement, no matter the population size, independence has been violated because the probability of what happened second depends on what happened first. So even if we have a bag of 20 marbles and we take one out, well, if we don't put that one back, there's now only 19 marbles left. So regardless, whatever happens second is going to be affected by what happened first. And even if the population was 10,000, if you take out a marble, there are still now 9,999 marbles left in the bag. So my point is, anytime you don't replace, it matters. 
in independence has been officially violated. But the difference in answers is considered negligible if the sample size is less than or equal to 10% of the population. Now, a lot of kids get this 10% rule kind of like misconstrued and don't fully understand it. But basically, if the amount we are taking out is less than 10% of the population, even though the probabilities technically change due to the non-replacement, it is okay. So if we go back to our problem, we were said, hey, listen, this distribution is from millions of marbles at the factory where they make out marbles. Okay, what's the probability you get two reds, red, red, and you don't put it back. Well, I'm only taking out two marbles. If there's millions of marbles in the room, two is definitely less than 10%. Now, if I take a marble out and don't put it back, like don't get me wrong, it does impact what happens second. But we say that that difference is negligible. It just doesn't matter because there's so many. So the first probability of getting that first red is still 20%, 0.20. But now, okay, we took that one red marble away. There's one less marble. But what? The probability is now 0.199999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999